It's my pleasure to announce Richard Fairhurst, our keynote speaker. It's kind of fitting that he is doing the first talk because he basically did OpenStreetMap before OpenStreetMap even existed. Uh, he ran something, I think it was called GeoWiki. Yes. Uh, um, so it was a collaborative geo data collection thing before OSM existed. Richard has also written uh, one of the, the, the well, the first really working online editor for OpenStreetMap, Potlatch, uh, now current in version three. Um, and he's now currently very busy doing the cycle.travel platform, which also uses OpenStreetMap. And I hear you've just launched an app um, for cycle.travel. So, yes. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that what, that's what he's doing for a living now, but since he's been with OpenStreetMap since the very beginning, he's going to give us uh, a nice talk about the community and its cherished independence. Welcome, Richard. Thank you. So my plan for today was to do a nice, nuanced, fair-minded, balanced talk about the many different uh, aspects of OpenStreetMap from the individual contributor right up to the massive companies who are now involved. However, I then spent two days trying to get to this conference, uh, courtesy of Welling Airlines, who are part of the International Airlines Group. As a result of this experience, I have now become a fully-fledged communist. I believe that all large companies, in particular International Airlines Group, should be ploughed into the ground and the earth salted after them. Uh, so you're going to have half... No, you're not really. I'm going to try and be fair-minded. Um, and we are 18 years old. Uh, this is absolutely astonishing. Yeah. It means we're grown up. We have to start behaving ourselves, which is uh, slightly scary. Uh, we were founded in 2004 by Steve Coast. Uh, and our first state of the map was just two years after that in, uh, in Manchester in England. Um, Manchester is uh, yeah, it's not, not quite the same as Florence. The architecture is not quite stunning. Uh, it, it does have trams. An advantage of the Manchester trams is that they don't fine you 40 euros if you forget you stamp your ticket, so that's not a bad thing. Um, but no, it, it was a good conference. And I was um, trying to work out uh, uh, some of the sort of early history of OpenStreetMap and looking back through things. And I found my presentation that I did for State of the Map 2006. And in that presentation, I was talking, and you'll have heard this whole thing a million times before about how because OpenStreetMap gives you the data rather than just a map to put things on then you can do interesting things with it and as an example of doing interesting things with maps I found this and this this is a slide I showed at uh, State of the Map 2006 this is a map from 1902 uh, which is a distribution of lunacy in the British Isles in 1902 I have no idea how they worked this out but um, this, this is a map of the places with most lunacy in 1902. Um, now, the really strange thing is, this is 1902, uh, and I've seen this map more recently. So, um, in 2016, the New York Times also did a map of uh, lunacy in the United Kingdom. And the same thing, the areas with the most lunacy are shown in dark red. It's almost uncanny. Uh, but, yeah, we, we tend to forget quite how revolutionary OpenStreetMap was. People thought we were lunatics in, um, in, in 2004. People thought it was absolutely mad to say that a bunch of volunteers could map the world. Um, we sort of seemed like this to people. This is a group called the Kindred of the Kibbo Kift. Uh, these are a bunch of sort of outdoor focused militant scouts from the 1920s. Uh, and they're a bunch of outdoor focused people with a mission to change the world. And their way of changing the world was by going camping and singing songs. Uh, our mission of changing the world was uh, going around uh, noting down street names and putting them in a computer, which is almost as daft. Um, no one has really heard of the Kindred of the Kibbo Kift in the intervening hundred years. Um, we did it. We did change the world. Um, and people didn't necessarily believe us in the early days. You know, we personally were very outwardly confident. We thought, yes, we're going to do this. We're building this amazing thing. People didn't necessarily agree. This was a talk that I did in 2012 to the International Cartographic Association. 
uh, International Cartographic Association. The unstoppable rise of OpenStreetMap, you know, it's slightly hubristic because in 2012 we were still very much a basic map. But, you know, we, we knew the way we were going. Uh, we were confident about these things. But people did not necessarily agree. Um, I was looking through some blog postings about the time. Um, 2015, a guy called Justin O'Byrne did this very influential posting called The Universal Map. He was basically saying that it's interesting the way that the world is all gravitating towards one map. Everyone is going to be using the same universal map in future. And the subtext is, and this map's going to be Google Maps. Um, he followed that up in 2017 by a really influential posting called Google Maps as Moat, which was saying that Google now has this moat that they're um, they, they are so far advanced in data and in technology that it's going to be really hard for people to catch up. And, you know, maybe there is some truth in that. Let's be honest, Google Maps is the most commonly used mapping application. There's no doubt about that on phones especially. Um, so maybe that is as near as anyone's got so far to the universal mapping app. But the real universal map is OpenStreetMap. I mentioned the New York Times earlier. The New York Times now, mention, uh, now makes maps out of OpenStreetMap data. If someone had told me that in 2004, 2006, I would not have believed them. Um, when, now look, there are so many of these massive companies whose maps are built on OpenStreetMap data. So Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon, Snap, Apple, Grab, all these people, this Grab Maps here. Um, and you know, sometimes this is for a fairly classic mapping application, something that is on your phone and is called something like Maps. And I'm sure lots of people here use OSM and or uh, Maps.me or Organic Maps or something like that, which is your you know straight down the line classic mapping application. But increasingly, not everything people's um, relationship with location is not always mediated through this one monolithic mapping app. Instead, it's the courier companies who deliver parcels to you. They use OpenStreetMap. It's the Facebook marketplace ads you reply to. They have OpenStreetMap embedded maps. It's the, um, the government who runs the place you live in. They use OpenStreetMap. This is where I live. I didn't have to tell them to do this. They said they just tweeted this out the other day. We're changing the roads. Here's a map of where it is. Of course, it's OpenStreetMap. You kind of grow to expect it these days, and this is astonishing. And do not think that people like Google haven't noticed this. Uh, very interesting article from earlier this year from TechCrunch. It's basically saying that the younger generation do not go to the app called Maps anymore. They go to Instagram or they go to Snap Maps or they go to TikTok or whatever it might be. And that is how they have their relationship with location. So basically, maybe we were right. Maybe for the last 18 years, we have been saying that it's important to give out the data rather than just a map. And doesn't that feel good to have been right for so long? Really nice. So I'm going to come back to this later, um, but this is an interesting bit at the bottom. Three pillars of Google's advantage at the moment, places, street view, 3D data. In a few years, I think it will just be places. Right, lots and lots of things have been written about corporate involvement in OpenStreetMap over the years, and I'm not going to rehash them all. There have been things written by smarter people than me. Some of those names are there. Uh, if you have a spare few minutes, go and Google some of them. They've all had good things to say. Don't necessarily agree with all of it. That's part of the fun of it all. Um, so what I want to do is more do a sort of commentary from an individual contributor's point of view about how to find yourself in OpenStreetMap in 2022. And, you know, it is fair to say that the relationship between open source projects and big companies has not always been easy. Uh, this, this is how Facebook used to describe it. Uh, and if you look at some of the foundational open source projects over the years, you know, things like Redis or Elasticsearch or MongoDB, um, in the past few years, a lot of them have actually moved away from being open source because they are scared of being trampled on by the really big guys. We haven't. Uh, we are still 100% fully open and proud of it. And that's despite the fact that we have had corporate involvement in OpenStreetMap since the very, very early days. Nestoria, um, London property site, was the first website to use OSM in a commercial context back in 2006. 2007, a company called CloudMade was the first OpenStreetMap-based startup. They were very much a sort of proto-map box in quite eerie similarities in a lot of ways. Uh, and then after that, big companies started getting interested. Yahoo, Flickr, MapQuest. Map, MapQuest was a big company at the time. It kind of seems weird now. Uh, and I was, I was looking back to see, when did I start using my OpenStreetMap knowledge for um, any commercial endeavors? And I found this. 
this was a, a as part of my job, which was nothing to do with maps, in 2008, I was editing a book about waterside pubs, and it struck me that uh, I could use OpenStreetMap for the maps in it, because in 2008, to be honest, our road network was not that great, but our pub data was really, really good. So it was absolute match made in heaven, it really was. And so we get from that to the situation where the biggest of big companies are now using OpenStreetMap, and what Something that has really uh, made me smile this time is um, this was 2012. Um, this was TomTom. Tom. Uh, Tom Tom did basically a piece that they sort of pushed out through their PR people uh, to various um, tech press places saying, hey, this open source mapping is not very good. TomTom Tom data is much better. Um, we now get to the situation where 2022, TomTom Tom are here. TomTom Tom is sponsoring the conference. TomTom Tom are registering OpenStreetMap. You know, this is brilliant. And can we have a round of applause for people like TomTom Tom who are now supporting OpenStreetMap? That's so good. And uh, the other great origin story about this, 2004, when Steve Coe set up OpenStreetMap, he very much did it kind of as a reaction to the Ordnance Survey. Um, Ordnance Survey is our national mapping agency in Britain. Uh, Steve wanted to use some map data. So he um, phoned up the Ordnance Survey and said, how, how do I get this data? And he said, well, first of all, you pay us 5,000 quid. Uh, then you put your lawyers into, in contact with our lawyers and we'll draw a contract. Uh, and Steve said, you know what, I'll go and start OpenStreetMap. Um, Ordnance Survey now have an app that you can download on the App Store and Play Store. Uh, it's called OS Maps. It uses OpenStreetMap data. This is, again, really amazing. So, this is all sounding a bit one way so far. It's, we do the data, these guys use it. And you might want to ask, a bit like Monty Python, what have the Romans ever done for us? Well, okay. The, there, was, there was the imagery, uh, there was the Yahoo and Bing and Maxar and Esri imagery. Okay, but apart from the imagery, what have these guys ever done for us? Well, there's content delivery network, there's Fastly, they do the content delivery network that gives us the titles. Yeah, okay, but apart from the imagery and the content delivery, oh yeah, and Mapbox, Mapbox wrote ID, uh, the editor. Okay, yeah, but apart from the imagery, content delivery network, the editors, the other editors, oh yeah, Facebook now do rapid, more editors. Um, you know, there, there is a real genuine two-way relationship here, and that's one of the really nice things about this. And in particular, vector tiles, if that rings any bells with people, vector tiles are kind of this new foundational technology that um, has basically meant that you can use OpenStreetMap on mobile devices and has been very much responsible for the adoption of OpenStreetMap more widely in the past few years. Really interesting dynamic here, because Mapbox invented vector tiles. They then went through, a few years later, the whole thing that people like Redis and Elasticsearch went through, which was that they were worried about big guys stomping on them. You know, do not forget that Mapbox are basically a unicorn. They have the billion dollar valuation. So if you're worried about people bigger than that stomping on you, you know, there's got to be something going on. So they took their vector tile client library, Mapbox GLJS, and um, closed it. They made it closed source. And, you know, I'm not going to blame them too much for that. Um, Hey, do we have anyone from Microsoft here who can fix the uh, projector? <laughs> Sorry, so yeah, um, uh, they, they decided that they were going to close it, and I, I cannot blame them for that. But what happened then is really, really interesting. We get this open source fork. We have an open source fork now of uh, Mapbox GL, which is called Map Libra. And this was started by some of the smaller companies like um, uh, Map Tyler and Stadia. But what you saw really soon is that big guys like Facebook and Microsoft and Lyft and Amazon came along and started contributing stuff to it. So you've got this interesting dynamic where actually now the really big companies are pushing towards almost enforcing openness because it works for them. And you know, they didn't have to do that. If you're Amazon, you are big enough that you could have had a private fork of Mapbox GL. You know, the impact on your bottom line is tiny. But no, they decided that they were going to keep this within the community and um, keep developing it. Of course, the other thing that um, big companies give us is eyeballs. This is just a random Facebook uh, event listing. And obviously, the, um, uh, the map on there is from OpenStreetMap. It would be kind of nice if it said OpenStreetMap in the corner. But yeah, we'll, we'll get there later. OK. This all sounds a bit rosy so far. There's got to be more to it than this, hasn't there? What could possibly go wrong? Um, and I'm going to look at this through the eyes of three people who have written interesting quotes about this uh, over the years. So 
First one, this is Tom McWright talking of the Geomob podcast earlier this year. And he says, you know, OSM cares a lot about its independence. That is true, we do. Uh, and that's totally fair when many corporations benefit so much from it. And yeah, you know, companies do have influence. If you give us imagery, then we're in Stuck if you take away the imagery. If you develop the editor and you decide to stop developing the editor, that puts us in a tricky position. So yeah, there is absolutely no doubt that big companies do have influence in OpenStreetMap. And we have to work out how to navigate that. What they are looking for from the uh, from the relationship what we as individual contributors are looking for navigating that motivation and motivation is a really important thing this is from some man who worked at mapbox until recently and i find this very interesting because the map that you make is not always going to be used for the purposes that you want it to be used for. Um, Saman was working for Mapbox. He was a guy who liked cycling his bike around town. He now found that the products he was making are being used to send cars places. I am also a fairly militant cyclist. Uh, I love cycling places. I have mapped um, roads that are now being used to send delivery trucks down. I have to get used to that, to be honest. Uh, it's the way that open source works. But it is, you know, that is something that we have personally got to navigate, uh, got to understand as how all of this works. And I didn't know Frederick was going to be uh, comparing this session, but uh, I have a quote from Frederick in here. And um, this is saying, you know, maybe it is difficult for those of us, the very smallest contributors, to actually have the same motivations as the big guys. Maybe this is slightly irreconcilable. And, you know, do not forget that Frederick runs a really successful OpenStreetMap um, services company, Geofabric. He's not sitting there with a sort of hippie outfit and flowers in his hair. I don't, no, no, no flowers in your hair today, Frederick. Probably not enough hair for that, actually, but uh, no, didn't say that. Uh, so, so, yeah, OK. Will OpenStreetMap inevitably end up being dominated by big companies? Um, and I don't think it will be. I think we are navigating our way to a, a nice way forward where pretty much there's room for everyone from the smallest to the biggest. And if that could be summed up in one tweet, it is this, which I saw the other day. This is just someone who has tweeted how to build your own Google Maps in three blog postings. Now, thought experiment, replace the word maps with search there, how to build your own Google search clone in three blog postings. It's not going to happen. You know, it's literally not possible. I mean, I can try. I think step one would be hack into a bank. Step two would be transfer 50 billion pounds from their account to yours. Uh, after that, I find it a bit more difficult. But um, how to create a Google Maps clone, you can actually do that. He explains how to do it with some of the um, some of the tooling that is available in OpenStreetMap and with OpenStreetMap data. And that is astonishing. Basically, OpenStreetMap street map levels the field between the very smallest um, and the very biggest there is this whole amazing universe of tooling that lets you do that um, this is something i've been building over the past few years called TileMaker, which takes uh, open street map data and makes vector tiles to put on a mobile phone out of it but there's so much more like this there's a similar utility called planet tiler there's uh, for geocoding there's nominatum and photon there's so much good routing software like graph hopper and osrm valhalla you know all of this amazing stuff that you can use to build your own uh, your own google maps clone or whatever it might be uh, and that is that is really something that we have managed to achieve over the past 18 years so that means that um, making money does not have to be the only, the sole end game in all of this. You do not have to be a massive uh, company in order to get stuff out of OpenStreetMap. So we have this astonishing ecosystem now from a million volunteer projects up to charities, up to NGOs, the whole humanitarian sphere, um, up to small companies, to um, one-man bands to smaller providers like Thunder Forest or Stadium Maps, up to companies like Cloak and Tech and GM Fabric, all the way up to the really big guys. Everyone here, everyone managing to create value out of OpenStreetMap. However that value is expressed, whether it's financial value, whether it's social value, whether it's making new whizzy toys or whether it's saving lives, people are doing that. And that is thanks to everyone in this room. So can I be a real crowd pleaser and ask you to applaud yourselves for that? Because we have managed to do that and that's astonishing. Many of these smaller guys differentiate, differentiate themselves by understanding the technology and understanding the mapping data better. And I find this an interesting example. This was earlier this year. Uh, two sites that launched this year, neither of them are specifically OpenStreetMap based. They're both mapping sites, build your own map sites that are to some extent based on OSM tech and OSM data. Um, Felt, top left, amazing site. Um, 20 million pounds of venture capital went into building that. Placemark, bottom right, 
also amazing site. One smart guy doesn't have 20 million pounds of venture capital. And OSM data and all these tools around it mean that the one smart guy has got as much of a chance of succeeding as the guys with 20 million dollars of venture capital. So I've been talking a lot about the technology and the tooling, and I will now talk a bit about the, uh, about the mapping, about the data. Uh, and there is a lot of corporate mapping happening at the moment. Mapping used to have a peak at the weekends, and now actually the weekdays are the busiest for mapping. Pascal Nice came up with that statistic, so it has to be right. Um, and you will find that what a lot of the corporate mapping is, is things like this, surface roads, driveway, stuff like that. It's slightly, I don't know, one dimensional. Um, there's a lot of lane mapping going on. There's a lot of quality assurance. And you know, this is good. If someone had come up to me five, 10 years ago and said, you're gonna have a thousand, 2000 new contributors who are doing all the really boring stuff like driveways. So you don't have to I said, yeah, bring it on. I love this. Um, but it does mean that, uh, that you know, it, it is not a complete map in and of itself. Um, this is a screenshot from my site, Cycle Travel, uh, and this is a, a nice bike route that you might want to cycle up. Pretty much all of the data on that was contributed by individuals, uh, and that tends to be true for most of the stuff that I find I use in OpenStreetMap. And what I think this means is that in order to get a diverse map, we need a, di um, a diverse contributor base. The contribut uh, contributions by corporate editors are not generally, in mapping terms, diverse in themselves. They're mostly from the perspective of I am trying to drive a car or a van somewhere. So what we need to do to get a more fleshed out, a more full featured map is expand the contributor base to be more diverse, to have more voices and more faces in it. One way we can do this is with the uh, with the editing tools. This is from Street Complete. This is absolutely brilliant. Uh, you can now point your phone at something and go, whoop, like that and measure um, something, and then that goes straight into OpenStreetMap using your, the camera on your phone. Uh, there's so much stuff that you can do with that. You can have you can put your phone on your handlebars, uh, ride along a bumpy track, and boing, 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 like that. Uh, measure how much going up and down it's doing with the accelerometer. That's a track type value. You can then put that in OpenStreetMap. All of this is reducing the barrier to entry because there is less grunt work uh, and the phone or the editor, whatever it might be, can be smarter. And by reducing the barrier to entry, we get more people, we get more diverse people and we get a better map out of it. So that's something. There must be a conclusion in all of this. And I think there is, which is that corporate and individual contributions are ultimately complementary. Um, more than that, they feed off each other. Um, my contributions are better because they are being used by the big guys and because they have built these amazing tools. Um, it, it works both ways. And this is, you know, do not underestimate how unusual this is, how rare this is in the open source world. Um, these are the situationists. They're a bunch of Paris revolutionaries from the 1960s who thought that they were going to change the world by drinking a lot and having internecine arguments bit like the early days of the OpenStreetMap mailing list, to be honest. Um, and one of their big ideas was what they called recuperation, which was that anything revolutionary eventually gets taken over by the mass media and turned into something harmless. Well, I think we've managed to escape that. We have managed to still preserve our independence, still preserve our unique way of doing things. And this is absolutely brilliant stuff. So I'm going to wrap up by asking what happens next? Where do we go from here? Now, it is traditional at some point in the State of the Map conference that uh, someone will stand up and say, what you need to do is map addresses and put lots of addresses in. And I am here to tell you, addresses are over. You no longer need to map addresses. They're all finished. Uh, and I can actually feel myself being glared at right now by Sarah, who runs uh, Nominatim. So I don't really mean that. But it's interesting to see how things are changing in that 10 years ago, if I wanted to find directions, then I had to punch in my address as the very first step of it. Now I don't, because my phone knows where it is. Um, if I want to find a point of interest, I used to have to type in the address of that point of interest. Now I don't, because in theory, there is a good point of interest database which has the lat long in it. So a lot of this is already done for us. So. Instead, I think addresses are important. What one of our big challenges now is points of interest. You would be amazed how bad everyone's points of interest data is. The only people who have good points of interest data are Google, back to that slide I said earlier, and OpenStreetMap in a few select places, including Florence. Florence is really good. Um, but this is just a screenshot of a random map provider. I'm not going to point out who it is because that's not important, um, in the city near where I live in. And this is the state of point of interest data. That library is in the wrong place. That museum is there twice. Um, that college is there twice with two very slightly different names. 
the bus stops have multiplied in ways that aren't really um, uh, reflected in reality. So there's a real opportunity for us there. I spent about 10 minutes a few days ago uh, correcting everything in my little town in um, Apple Maps. Uh, and they had a really nice user interface for doing this. And I thought, why can't we have a user interface like that? And then, literally the next day, Ilya, who is here today, I know, because I spoke to him earlier, tweeted out, hey, I've just done this app called um, Every Door. It's a point of, uh, point of interest collector and corrector for um, OpenStreetMap. You can download it from the App Store. It's superb. Well done, well done Ilya. This is this fantastic new um, app where you can go in, find points of interest where you are, correct them, add new stuff, um, and yeah. I would encourage everyone here to go and download Every Door, it's called. It's on all the App Stores, and you can pretty much in a day make a massive difference to our points of interest coverage. Final takeaways for this, um, keep it cordial. It is really interesting, really easy as an individual contributor to get cross with corporate mappers if they do something you don't like. Don't do that. Uh, you know, try and keep it humane. Try and keep it respectful. Similarly, for corporate um, OpenStreetMap organizations, I know that sometimes we can seem like a bunch of eccentrics fixating on little things. That's what makes OpenStreetMap the great thing it is. So have some patience with us and don't steamroller over all of that. And go out and map things. Download every door. It is brilliant. Build some new things. Map more things. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. That was a great talk. Um, I have, we have no really questions about your content. The, most, the, the only questions that we have online is about whether there will be any recordings of this. And yes, there will be. Uh, I cannot promise when, but uh, they will be available. Um, Richard, one question that, you know, you, you quoted me earlier saying that I don't think the goals uh, align. Uh, have you not seen any corporate contributions to OSM where you thought, okay, these are really shit and need to be need to be removed? You know, you, you said keep it cordial, and you know we all sort of have different perspectives. One one kind of kind of corporation maps driveways, and you pr prefer mapping cycleways. But haven't you seen anything where you say, okay, this is really misunderstanding OpenStreetMap and needs to go? Yes, sometimes. So uh, we, we have a thing in, in Britain. We are very keen on mapping what we call the rights of way, which is basically footpaths, cycleways, that sort of thing. Um, it's quite intricate. It's quite easy for people mapping driveways to accidentally, and this is very much accidentally, stomp all over these and lose some of the nuance that we have put in there. And I have to check myself because I find myself, you know, sort of saying, right, oh, I am angry Richard, bad things have happened here, I'm going to write a cross change set comment. And then think, no, hang on, the guy who has put in this driveway has done it to the best of his ability, to the best of his will, uh, doesn't realise that he's doing something um, slightly complicated here. So I, I literally, last, uh, last week or the week before, I found myself getting angry in a change set comment, and I thought, no, Richard, stop this. Um, and what I did was I went to the wiki and wrote a new page uh, which said, hey, if you are a corporate editor and you are mapping in Britain, and this is some of the nuance you might need to be aware of. And yeah, you know, bad things do sometimes happen, but we can work this through. Uh, I do not think that there is something endemic about corporate editing that needs to be sorted out. I think it can all be, you know, smoothed over nicely. Right. Do we have any questions in the audience? No, then thank you again, Richard. Thank you.